so good morning everybody i would like to thank the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to present this uh, talk to you i must apologize in advance to vikram and the organizers because at the last minute i had to cancel because of some personal commitments but anyway let's move ahead and today i have been asked to speak to you about study design regarding cohort studies these are my conflicts of interest and to define cohort study cohorts basically represent a group of people with a defined characteristic who are followed up to determine the incidence of or the mortality of a specific disease or causes of death or some other outcome the key word cohort therefore basically implies a group and this word comes from this group of people these are roman military soldiers and people who have a bit of knowledge about history will know that this is probably the most effective fighting force we had in the medieval times one of the key elements of this fighting force was the organization they had and the logistics that they improved upon as compared to the ancient armies of the time and the cohort system was actually designed to ensure that they knew which group of persons or which group of soldiers were at a particular battlefield position at any particular point of time so when should you do these cohort studies so i think you understand now after the last eight lectures especially when you have had lectures on case control studies that there is something called as an exposure it basically means a risk factor or a parameter that influences some thing which is known as the outcome so when there is an association we know there is an evidence of association between an exposure and outcome and this evidence you have obtained from previously conducted case control studies or retrospective studies you know scientifically or based upon your data that there is a reasonable time interval between the exposure and development of outcome the reasonable word is important because you really do not want this interval to be very long in which case a cohort study planning is nearly impossible information is actually available about the exposures of interest so if it's an exposure which you cannot quantify or measure designing a cohort around that exposure is very difficult and finally your interest is in determining the incidence hazard and relative risk so in the design of a study i think this has been probably told to you previously also cohort studies case control studies are examples of observational study designs which actually allow you to determine the association between these variables if you really are looking for a causative link so as to speak then you need to perform some sort of an experimental study an example of which is a randomized controlled trial so there are two broad types of cohort designs i will not really go into the minute of them but what is important for you to understand here is that in the cohort studies you have a study population which comprises of two groups one of which is exposed to the risk factor an example of a risk factor can be smoking similarly it can be alcohol and so on and in this exposed group and in the unexposed group you basically then find out whether they developed an event or not so most of the classical cohort study designs are prospective which means they are looking ahead so you start with a cohort which you identify today in terms of their exposure you quantify their exposure and you follow them up over a reasonable period of time to identify whether they developed out of interest so an example of a cohort can be group of persons who attended the aspire class and an outcome of interest may be how many of you actually went on to do an investigator initiated study say 5 years from now so this would be an example of a prospective what is a retrospective cohort study a retrospective cohort study is a study where you have a group of individuals for whom you know that you have the outcome your cohort is actually not defined by the outcome but it is identified back in time when you go through the records and identify whether they have a particular exposure of interest now for example in this case this may be as simple as say a birth cohort both cohorts are often examples of retrospective cohort which means for example you know whether the patient who was um, child who was born was admitted in the neco or not so that can be an example of a cohort which you obtain or identify from previous case records 
Why do you want to do a cohort study? Because you want to determine whether there is a temporal association between the exposure and outcome. And why is this important? Because if you remember your basic epidemiology classes that have been taken in your MBBS time, and I imagine most of you are doctors here, uh, the temporal association, that is whether the exposure precedes the outcome, is a very important aspect of determining causation. Multiple types of outcomes can be studied in a cohort study. So you are not limited to a single outcome. And this is one of the biggest strengths of the cohort study. You can study things like a stroke, AMI, cancer, death due to any cause, or any other outcome that you desire and predefine in a cohort study. You can also look at exposures which are rare. For example, an exposure to an environmental carcinogen. Why is the cohort design useful in these scenarios? Because oftentimes, recall bias becomes a problem when you are doing a case control study. Better recording of exposures is obviously possible, particularly when exposures will happen over a longer period of time, because this avoids the recall bias. And finally, a cohort study actually allows you to measure the incidence. Why is that so? Because you have a defined denominator, which is the total number of your patient persons in your cohort or your cohort size. Now let's look at how you define the population of a cohort. In order to define the population of a cohort, you can consider a general population-based cohort. This basically requires a thorough survey and understanding of the community. So here you are basically going into the community and including the entire community as a cohort you would want to study. These are usually expensive large-scale studies and often publicly funded. Industry usually doesn't fund these kind of studies. The classical example, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, is the Framingham Heart Study. Because these are population-based studies, they allow investigation of several outcomes. And because these are population-based studies, again, the exposure should be relatively common for you to measure it. You can do it in special economic groups also. You can derive your cohort from a population like, for example, Doll's study on the registered medical practitioner from UK where they use this cohort to identify the influence of tobacco or smoking on future cardiovascular risk. You can identify cohorts using high risk groups when the exposure is rare. Classical examples will be studies related to occupational safety. For example, the Bhopal gas strategy uh, cohort would be a classical example of such a cohort. Here the exposure is rare, but when it happens, it does affect a significant chunk of a local population. And therefore, this is a cohort study. This is an ideal study size for cohorts. How do you define your comparison group in cohort studies? Please remember that in cohort studies, we have two groups. One is the exposed group, where you have the exposure of interest. And the other is an unexposed group, where you do not have the exposure of interest. So there are two types of comparison groups possible. One is an internal group, where the comparison group is identified from the cohort itself and classified based upon the degree of exposure. An example would be when you have a cohort where you're classifying them based upon the years of exposure to tobacco. So you may decide to have person years of tobacco exposure, say as 10 years or less, can be definition of your exposed versus unexposed population. An external control is useful when the exposure is, of course, uniform within the cohort. A classical example would be, say, exposure to a pesticide. Selection bias can occur in the choice of the comparison group if the exposure risk in the control group is not well defined. This is particularly true if you are studying rare exposures. When the outcome data for the control group is missing, this is an example of inadequate follow up procedure. And other risk factors which are associated with the disease may differ in comparison. This is known as a healthy worker effect. Now, what is a healthy worker effect? I will describe this later on also. But it basically means that in order to work or continue working, you need to be healthy. So, by definition, if you are selecting a group of people who are working and not working, you have an outcome, say, of health, you have already defined your cohorts based upon the outcome instead of the 
exposure of interest. I hope this is clear to everyone. When to measure the exposure in a prospective cohort, you will of course do it over a period of time. Why? Because it is less susceptible to recall bias, although it is more expensive and time consuming. A retrospective cohort, your exposure measurement will be done using reliable records from the past. It is extremely important when you are performing a cohort study that the measurement of the exposure that you do should be done in a reproducible manner, which means you should do it in a way that it can be reproduced by your investigating team. And confounders can usually be measured reliably in prospective design. And we will see some examples of confounders influencing the outcomes in your cohort study in the subsequent slides. Cohort studies are, of course, susceptible to bias. Various types of bias can be present. You can have something called as an ascertainment bias. What is it? Suppose you are conducting a cohort study of persons who are smokers versus non-smokers. Now you have some data to suggest that smokers may be at a higher risk of developing lung cancer. You may subject them to a high resolution CT scan, say at five year intervals as a screening CT. On the other hand, in non-smokers, you decide to do a simple chest X-ray. So this will obviously result in a bias because you will pick up more cancers in patients who are smokers. And this higher rate of pickup may not be really related to your exposure that is smoking, but simply to how you performed your surveillance. The next important source of bias is attrition bias. What is attrition bias? Attrition bias is basically loss to follow with different degrees of loss among those with or without harm. Now, this is not only something that is unique to cohort study. This is actually possible in any kind of a prospective study that you do that participants who have an outcome have a different rate of loss to follow up as compared to those who do not. What does this mean? Suppose you are studying cancer in, say, a northeastern part of the country. You are assuming that you will check the incidence of oral cavity cancer in patients or participants who are exposed to betel nut chewing versus those not. Now, what will happen or may happen is because the northeastern part of India is poorly served by cancer facility. It may so happen that when people notice a lesion which they are suspicious about, they migrate out towards the other part of the country and therefore you will lose them from your cohort. Or you have scenarios where younger males move out. This is classically seen in rural communities in India, where younger males will move out during the summer season when it is the non growing time to seek employment in cities. So, again, this can lead to loss of follow up if you have a short duration cohort study, for example. What is information bias? Information bias arises when you have uniform, a lack of uniform reporting of missing data. What does this mean? It means that suppose you have missing data, but you report it differently in two different groups. Your cohort and your control does not have the same reporting of missing data. In this case, what happens is you do not understand why this missing data has happened. And oftentimes, the reason why this missing data has happened is because of the way the outcomes have happened. Volunteer bias is another very important source of bias in cohort studies. What is volunteer bias? Oftentimes, cohort studies will be performed with volunteers because it is easy to do. However, when you are doing a study using volunteers, what you have to remember is that people who are volunteering for the study are not necessarily representative of the population they are from. And this phenomena has been seen in several cohort studies. They often tend to be more educated. They often tend to be more socioeconomically well to do. And they often tend to be younger which is why they actually have the capability to volunteer. And therefore, the association of volunteerism with their outcome becomes important. I've already spoken about the healthy worker bias in the previous slide. 
So essentially this happens when the membership of the cohort is contingent upon the absence or presence of the outcome. So for example, if you are looking at outcomes like occupational uh, hazards related to say uh, lung cancer or COPD, people who do not have a COPD typically tend to become workers in the occupation, while people who have COPD will not because they simply are not fit enough to work. So this is an example of a healthy worker bias. So this is what the design of a cohort study looks like. So you have a population which may be diseased or disease free. So please remember the very important aspect about cohort study which I mentioned was ability to calculate the incidence. This comes from the fact that you are defining your cohort from this population. Some of these population may be diseased, some of these may be disease free. You select the disease free population. How do you select it? By making sure that these people do not have the outcome. And then you determine whether they are exposed to the factor or not over a period of follow up time. And you see whether they develop the disease or remain disease free. After doing this, you come up with a chart like this. This chart basically is often called as a confusion matrix. And what it tells you is the number of people who have been exposed to a factor and those who have had the disease of interest. Now, what does this allow you to do further? You can now calculate what is the estimated risk of the disease in the exposed group. So, what is the risk of disease? So, disease happened in this A subgroup who were exposed to the population and it did not happen in B, in C, who were exposed to the factor. So total number who were exposed to the factor was A plus C. So A divided by A plus C is the risk of the disease in people who are exposed. What is the estimate of risk in the unexposed group? It is B, that is who had disease but were not exposed while D is the people who did not have the disease and were not exposed. So B divided by B plus D is the estimate of risk in the unexposed group. So the estimate of relative risk therefore is the risk in the exposed divided by this in the unexposed. Now you have come across an analogous ratio called the odds ratio in the previous lecture in the case control study. So why can't you define the risk ratio in a case control study. This may have been taken up in your past lecture, but the reason is very simple. When you are doing a case control study, you have no idea of which population these cases and controls come from. And because of this, you cannot define the relative risk using a case control study. How do you interpret the relative risk? Relative risk interpretation is quite simple. The risk of the disease divided by the risk of the divided by the outcome. The relative risk of two therefore means there is a twice the risk of disease or the outcome of interest if your exposure or factor is present. A relative risk because it is a ratio can vary between zero to infinity, and typically a relative risk between zero to one indicates a reduced risk. This must be interpreted in the context of the underlying risk. Please remember this. What does this mean? A relative risk is a percentage. So there is a baseline risk of any outcome in the population. And because that baseline risk already determines the outcome, any factor that you are studying is studied on top of that factor. So for most of the cohort studies, while the relative risk is reported, the adequate interpretation requires you to understand the baseline risk in order to truly define the utility of that information. Now, this is very classical in food science literature. You will see studies which say chocolate is harmful to health, chocolate is useful to health, alcohol is harmful to death, alcohol is useful to death. And when you actually calculate in terms of absolute numbers, you will find that if you maybe have like a thousand participants, the study probably tells maybe one or two may be harmed or benefited in the intervention of interest. And therefore, relative risk, of course, needs to be interpreted with its. 95% confidence difference. Now, what are the sources of bias in cohort study? And I am focusing on bias because you need to understand the weakness of the study design before you start to implement it. We can categorize these bias into three broad categories. Bias arising out of selection, information bias, and confusion bias. 
Selection bias arises because how the participants are selected and followed. Information bias originates in observed individuals, observers, or measurement instrument. And confusion bias is related to the relationship between variables, which are related both to the outcome interest and the exposure, typically known as confounders. Selection bias can arise because of assessment of exposure. We have already discussed how volunteer health bias and healthy worker bias affects the cohort study results. Compared to cohort, compared cohorts are receiving other interventions like public health intervention. For example, if you are doing a study on the impact on tobacco exposure and lung cancer. Now, if a cohort of participants is also getting other interventions like taxation on tobacco products or adverse imagery on tobacco products, this will actually influence your incidence estimates. So therefore, this may drive down or drive up your relative risk. When cohort characteristics may influence measure of the outcome, again, this may be a source of selection bias. For example, if you have a cohort where you are assessing the neurocognitive development, but these tests rely on the handedness. For example, if you are an instrument which is designed in such a way that it has to be placed by a right-handed individual, a left-handed individual will automatically perform poorly in that test. And therefore, what you will find is that it's not really the exposure is determining the performance of the test, but something that is intrinsic to the person, that is the handedness. Now, of course, eliminating this sort of bias requires a deep understanding of the disease process, as well as the measurement of exposure. And therefore, and this is exactly where clinician inputs in designing cohort studies is so very important. Finally, you have a lack of calibration and standardization in exposure elicitation. What does this mean? You know you want to collect exposure data, but if you do it in a way where the instruments are not standardized, instruments are not calibrated, you will capture them in a different manner. A very classical example may be when you are trying to get information regarding salt exposure in diet. Now, if you go and ask 100 people of how, what they mean by adequate salt, the gram is not mentioned anywhere. Even most of the cooks will say salt to taste. Now, what is salt to taste? It completely varies between individuals. So, therefore, finding out what is the correct amount of exposure is extremely critical when you are designing cohort studies. What is information bias? Information bias, as I have mentioned, arises when there is differential loss to follow or the follow-up is contingent upon the outcome of interest. There may be missing data related to exposure, particularly if you are doing a retrospective cohort study, simply because the records may not be complete. And it is important to understand that while it may be tempting to exclude these participants where there is missing data, oftentimes the missing data is not at random. There is something that has happened which has resulted in missingness. And this may be tied to the exposure of interest. And therefore, eliminating missing data is not really a solution. And therefore, when you are designing retrospective cohort studies, it is important to be aware of data quality issues when you are designing these studies. Misclassification bias can arise because of using different standards for evaluating the outcome of interest. For example, you may decide to do more cardiac MRI to pick up blocks or coronary artery disease, smokers versus non-smokers. Lack of blinding of observers remains another important source of bias. If your observers know that the person or participant is exposed to the exposure of interest, he or she may decide to take a closer look to find out whether the outcome has happened. And finally, the Hawthorne effect. Hawthorne effect actually operates on the level of the individuals who is a part of the cohort. They simply change their behavior because of the realization that they are being observed. And Hawthorne effect basically results in an amendment of exposure. So, for example, if you are trying to find out in a cohort study what is the impact of a sedentary lifestyle on their future cardiovascular mortality, participants in the cohort study who are actually supposed to be sedentary may start doing more exercise simply by knowing that they are part of a cohort which is sedentary. This would be an example of a Hawthorne effect. 
Let's example, let's take an example of what happens when you have loss to follow. So in the first row, I have a study where there is a hundred participant, thousand participant cohort study who have been exposed, a thousand number who have been unexposed. We found hundred cases. This can be any case. It can be say even think like a lung cancer. It can be think like a oral cavity cancer. And cases in the non-exposed were 10. What is the relative risk? In the exposed cohort, 100 participants developed a cancer out of 1000. In the unexposed, 10 and out of 1000. And therefore, the relative risk of developing with the exposure of interest, say, between not chewing, is 10. What will happen if, say, 50 cases were lost to follow? You can see the relative risk will immediately drop down to 5. Because of these 100 cases, you could not observe cases in 50. What will happen if you lose cases in the control group? Your relative risk will jump up. Now, just see, just a small number of individuals needs to go out to actually make a huge difference in relative risk, particularly when you are talking about loss to follow up in controls. What is incidence density? Incidence density is a method that is used in cohort study to quantify the exposure where the exposure happens over a period of time and may not be individual in may not be uniform across the two cohorts. For example, non smokers can turn into smokers and vice versa. Therefore, calculating the incidence over a period of time may be fallacious. Incidence is of course the number who developed divided by the number of the total participants. Incident density measures the exposure in units of person time, that is person hours or days. And therefore, incidence density is what? Number of incident cases over a period of time divided by the total person time of exposed individuals. So here you are not quantifying the exposure in terms of presence or absence. You are quantifying the exposure in terms of person hours or person days of exposure. Classical example will be smoking alcohol consumption, which you have quantified in terms of person days, person weeks, or person months. Confusion bias. Now, confusion bias is an important source of bias in any observational study. It also basically arises because of various forms of confounders. Spurious association occurs when a factor is associated with both the exposure as well as the outcome. For example, fatty liver disease has been found in some studies to be associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now we know that fatty liver disease is actually associated with alcohol consumption. Alcohol consumption is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a classical example of a spurious association. Cohorts may have an inherent imbalance in terms of age and gender. For example, in India, if you take a cohort of BD workers, they will have a higher representation of females. Now you know that females may have a lower predisposition to develop certain disease intrinsically. And therefore, if you are designing a cohort study based upon a BD worker cohort, you have to take into account this gender imbalance which arises simply from the fact that females are more working in this occupation. The dose of exposure may be also a source of confusion. For example, consumption of sugar may be variable from time to time. And therefore, in these situations, as I have mentioned, you need to collect the time duration and you need to have very calibrated and standardized measures for your exposure. Finally, interactions can happen when factors may reduce or increase the effect of the outcome when they occur together. For example, smoking and indoor food smoke exposure. Now, let's take out a few ways to avoid confusion bias. You can do something called as restriction. What is restriction? That is restrict the entry of the participants who have a known confounder. While this improves the internal validity, that is the validity of your study, it reduces external validity. Why? Because your population of, is no longer represented by your cohort. It also limits recruitment, which, imp, which is an important challenge when you are performing large scale cohort study. Another method is matching. Now, this is classically employed in case control studies to reduce bias. 
However, this is difficult to do in prospective studies because the exposure is an important factor that you're measuring. So you cannot match by exposure. Stratification is a method which is an analytical method which can be used to determine the effect of the confounding factor. And finally, I have not put one last thing which is regression analysis. Regression analysis is a more sophisticated way of trying to understand the effect of different variables on the outcome. So let's go through a worked example of how stratification works out. This is an example of a cohort study where participants who were exposed to wood smoke were followed to determine how many developed tuberculosis. From this table, we can see that in the people who had exposure to wood smoke, around 71% went on to develop TB, while those who were not exposed to wood smoke, only 33% developed. So the relative risk of developing tuberculosis after exposure to wood smoke is quite simple. 2.15. I hope this is clear to everyone. This work example I have actually taken from this nice chapter, which you can refer to with some modifications in the numbers. Now let's take an example of what happens if we stratify them based upon smokers and non-smokers. So in the table on the left in green, we have the incidence data for people who were smokers on the right. We have the incidence data for those who are not. We can see that when we look about in participants who are smokers, the relative risk comes out to be around 2.22. While in non-smokers, the relative risk comes out to be 2. The work example shows how we can do this. The interpretation of these results is when you have people who are exposed to wood smoke, the risk of developing TB is in around 2.15 times in those as compared to those who do not have exposure to wood smoke. Relative risk of TB in those who are exposed to wood smoke and never smokers is around 2, while relative risk of TB in those who are exposed to wood smoke and smokers is 2.2. So exposure to smoking increases the risk of developing TB by around 22%. So simple 2 minus 2.22. How do we determine the interaction between smoking and wood smoke exposure? In order to do that, we will first have to find out people who have not been exposed to wood smoke and were smokers and try to find out whether they developed tuberculosis or not. So the boxes highlight the cells where this information is available. So in this group, people were not exposed to wood smoke and they developed tuberculosis in smokers. Same for the patient, the participants who were non-smokers. How do we determine the interaction? Again, in this group of people, we can see that the relative risk of developing tuberculosis is around two. How do we calculate? Simple incidence of TB in smokers divided by incidence of TB, not smoker. How do we determine the actual interaction? So let's work out the incidence. The incidence of TB without any smoking, which is actually your baseline risk, right? Your participant does not have exposure to smoking, does not have participant, does not have exposure to any tobacco smoke also. Around 20% of these participants want to develop TB. Incidence of TB with smoking only is around 10%. So actually, you can think of it in this way, that smoking probably is conferring some degree of protection. Now, whether it is smoking which is directly conferring this protection or something that is producing smoking is causing this uh, interaction is difficult to understand from this design. When you have wood smoke only, around 40% of the participants develop tuberculosis. And when you have both of these, around 88.9% develop tuberculosis. What is the attributable risk? So attributable risk is basically the risk which can be attributed to the risk factor of interest after subtracting it from the baseline incidence. So this for an example in smoking is minus 10%. What is the attributable risk to wood smoke is around 20%. And attributable risk to both wood smoke and tobacco is therefore 10%. The expected incidence is therefore the baseline risk that is 
plus the attributed risk due to both the factors is around 30 percent so this helps us in isolating from the single cohort study we can therefore isolate the attributable risk to tobacco and wood smoke in this same cohort so finally what about the limitations once more i would like to emphasize this cohort studies cannot directly relate your assertion of causation you cannot say that this caused that from cohort study result these are time consuming and expensive to conduct these are not good for rare outcomes or outcomes which take a very long period of time to manifest and finally it is important that you understand that if you are trying to determine an association between an exposure of interest and outcome you are trying to calculate the incidence you are trying to calculate the relative risk cohort studies are the only way to go ahead although they are very expensive and time consuming to conduct they give very meaningful insights about disease causation and etiopathogenesis thank you